Well, good morning. Glad to uh, see each and every one of you here this morning, and we certainly hope that uh, you are blessed by being here uh, this morning. Uh, this morning we are continuing our series through the book of Nehemiah, so if you want to open your Bibles uh, there, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. So uh, my wife is a big Harry Potter fan, and um, when we were in high school, this is before we started dating, I obviously had a huge crush on her, and so I told her that I would read through the Harry Potter books. I told her that I would read the whole series, and we could talk about it, you know. Um, and I did pretty good for a while. I read the first book probably within a couple of months, and so I, I read the first book, and then I probably didn't pick up a Harry Potter book for the next 10 years. Um, and, um, and then COVID hit, and I had no longer had any excuse at all the time in the world. And so I finally, when 2020 came, I picked it up, picked up the book, started with book one, and read through the whole series. So I finally, 10 years later, fulfilled my promise to read the books for my wife. Um, the reason I, I tell you that story um, is how many times do we come to the Bible or, and we make a, some sort of resolution to say, you know what, this year I'm going to read through the whole Bible. This year I'm going to start with Genesis and I'm going to read through the whole thing. And then we start and we read through Genesis, we read through Exodus, and then life happens or we hit Leviticus and then, you know, we just are done. And then we, you know, and we, and we, the Bible gets kind of shoved off to the side. And then the next year, the same thing happens. And the next year, the same thing happens. Why is it so often that the Bible gets shoved off to the side? That the reading of God's word gets pushed off because life happens. I think it's inter interesting here in Nehemiah chapter 8 that we have this certain scripture right here. Because there's been a lot happening in the book of Nehemiah so far. You know, Nehemiah has finished building the wall. He's faced opposition along the way. He's faced as adversity, but he finished the wall in, in 52 days. And the author could have easily just said, all right, that's the end of the book. We built the wall. We're done. That's, that's all I need to say. But no, he takes time to record this part where they read, they open and read the book of the law of Moses. And so let's go ahead and, and open there to, um, I'm actually going to read the second part of the last verse in, in chapter 7. It says, when the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given Israel. And accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. So I want to take a moment here to note the time that all this is happening. So he said this is happening in the seventh month. Now, that may not seem like a significant detail, but in to Israel, the seventh month was a very significant month. Um, the seventh month signified three different festivals for them, were three separate occasions for them. One was the Feast of Trumpets, or what's known today as, as Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Um, and then on the tenth day of the month, they would celebrate the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer sacrifice on behalf of all the people. And then lastly, they would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering how God had sent them into the wilderness and rescued them out of Egypt. So the seventh month is a very significant month for Israel. And to me, it seems like it's no coincidence that they finish the wall in the sixth month just in time for the seventh month so that they then can partake in these festivals. And so here in chapter 8, in, in verse 1, it says that the people gathered together. Now notice that it's not Ezra that calls for this assembly. It's not Nehemiah that calls for this assembly. It's not any of the Levites that call for this assembly. Who's calling for this assembly? The people are, get, are calling for this assembly. Literally, it says in the Hebrew that they're gathering as one man. So they are unified in their gathering and they're unified in their purpose for gathering. And Nehemiah describes their purpose for gathering as they ask Ezra 
to bring out the book of the law of Moses. So their purpose for gathering is so that the book of the law can be read. The people are initiating this reading of God's word. And they would have to because Ezra was really the only, one of the only ones who had access to the, the scrolls. So they, it's not like any person could just wander into the temple and grab the scrolls. No, Ezra had to be the one to go in, take the scrolls, and so then he could bring them out and read them. But it's still significant that the people are initiating this reading. They had a desire and a hunger to read, hear the words of the law. And so Ezra does so, and it says he does this for everyone, men, women, and children, who could hear this with understanding. So everyone has the ability to understand it, men, women, and children. Anyone who is willing to understand can come out and listen and understand the word of God. Anyone, regardless of of who they are, what age they are, they can come out and hear the word of the Lord and understand it. I think this points back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, um, when Moses is kind of um, giving a, them a reminder of the law before they go into the promised land. And this is what he says in uh, chapter 31, starting in verse 9. He says, Then Moses wrote, wrote down this law and gave it to the priests, the son of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Moses commanded them, Every seventh year in the scheduled year of remission, during the festival of booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, as well as the aliens residing in your towns, so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and to observe diligently all the words of this law, and so that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. So, now I don't think that they're necessarily thinking about the festival of booths when, they're, when they are initiating this reading, but it, it points back to that very idea that all the people of Israel are gathering together to hear the word. They're initiating this. They have a desire and a hunger for it. And I think that begs the question for us, you know, what kind of hunger and desire do we show for God's word? You know, these people, like I said, didn't have full access to the word. They had to tell Ezra, okay, go get the scroll so we can listen to it. You know, for us, we have unlimited access to the word of God. You, just, you can just go online and look up a scripture. You can pull out your phone and pull up the Bible app. You can go to a store and buy a Bible. Like, we have unlimited access to the word of God. So what is our excuse when it comes to us not reading the word? Not listening to the word. Because God desires that all of us desire his word. Men, women, and children. No matter who you are, no matter what age you are. God wants you to desire his word. His revelation to you. He, he gave it to you so that you could hear it. So that you could read it. So that you could understand it. And that's what these people are showing here. And that's what we need to show in our lives As well, I think this entire scripture gives us kind of a a good way in which we can approach scripture. We how can we approach reading and listening to the word? And I think the first point here is that we need to pay careful attention to the word. Starting in verse three, um, it says, "He, being Ezra." Read it from read it, um, or yeah, he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, uh, those who could understand, and the ears of all the law were attentive to the book of the law. So it says here that Ezra gets up and he starts reading, and he said he reads from morning until midday. Now, in our terms, that's about probably about six in the morning to about noon. That he's reading the scriptures for six hours. Now, we gather here on Sunday morning for an hour, an hour and a half at most. And oftentimes when it gets past that hour mark, we get a little bit antsy. 
because they're probably getting a little bit hungry. And so we want to, you know, we're be like, all right, we, you know, we, you know, we heard enough, pastor, let's, let's, let's move on so I can go to lunch. Like, that's kind of sometimes what our attitude is. But here they are sitting and listening to the word for six hours or even longer. And so again, shows that desire to hear the word of the Lord. Now, Ezra is probably reading a selection of scriptures because it would take much longer than six hours to read the entire book of the law. Um, if you've ever tried to sit down and read it, you're not going to get through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in six hours. You're just not. Um, and so he's probably reading a, a selection here. But if you notice here, it says that the people's ears were attentive to the book. Now, in the Hebrew, there's actually not, the word attentive actually isn't there. The word in the Hebrew is actually more of a word that means like their ears were toward the book of the law. It's kind of a, they were, it's almost like they were leaning in to the book. They were, they were listening. They were on the edge of their seat, paying close attention to every word that Ezra was reading. Now, um, growing up, I've, I've, always been, I've always been a sports fan. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I loved, I loved sports. And I um, mean, so much so that my first word was ball. Like, I didn't say mama or dada first. I said ball first. So, you know, that was any indication of, of what I liked. Um, but uh, growing up and still today, um, I am a uh, Dallas Mavericks fan playing the NBA. And um, my favorite player growing up was a guy named... Michael Finley, and you're probably like, who is that? Well, it's a fair question. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't the best player, the most famous player, but he was a good player. He was my favorite, so that's what matters. Um, but, um, you know, he, I would always, you know, live, growing up in Oklahoma, their games were always on. And so uh, what I would do, I was like five or six when I would do this. Their game would be on, and I would, I would um, get really close to the TV, and I would put my finger on him, and then I would just follow him wherever he went on the screen. So he went this way, I would follow him this way. If he went this way, he followed this. Now if he's obviously on the bench, I wouldn't just keep my finger there the whole time while he was on the bench. But, you know, I would, I would pay close, while he was on the court, I'd pay close attention to everywhere that he went. And similarly here, that's what the people in, in, um, the, of Israel are doing here. They're, they're, they're leaning in, they're paying close attention to every word that Ezra is saying. And sometimes when we approach scripture ourselves, we just kind of read it to read it. Like we just read the words that don't really mean much. I'm like, all right, I did my Bible reading today. I read my chapter. I did my devotion. I'm good to go. But do we pay very close attention to the words that we're reading? Because if we, if we pay close attention to those words, they're going to have an impact on us. We don't just read to read. We read to understand. We read to know the God who revealed it to us more. And that's what these people are doing here. Now, here in verses 4 and 5, um, for here in verse 5, Ezra's gonna, or the, the author's going to kind of take a step back. And, and he's going to look at what were they doing before Ezra even started reading the book. In verse 5... I'm going to spare you that list of names. It's in verse 4. But in verse 5, um, he says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So before Ezra even started reading the book, Ezra wants the people to recognize where the book came from, who it came from. It says he blesses the Lord. And what, what's the people's response? They say, amen, amen. It's a word of agreement. And they're lifting up their hands. And he opens the book. And what do the people do? They stand up. It is an act of reverence, an act of respect for the word. And so before ever reading the scripture... He recognizes whom the scripture came from in the first place. And I think oftentimes when we come to scripture, that's not how we approach it. We approach it as, oh, it's another book I have to read. It's just something I have to do. But if we approach it in, in, in this way and we say, this book was revealed to us by the God of the universe. 
This book was revealed to us by the God who loves us. This book was revealed to us by the God who saves us. I think if we approach it in that way, not only will I think it will lead for us to have a greater reverence for the word, but I think it will let us have a greater motivation to understand it because we want to know this God more. We want to know the God who revealed this word to us more. We want to understand him. And obviously we will never fully understand him, but this word gives us a picture of who he is. And, and, and what happens next here is, is, is that very thing. They, they get the word interpreted for them. The, the word is carefully interpreted. Uh, starting in verse, um, in verse 7, um, says, um, Also, uh, Jeshua, Bani, Sher- uh, this is why I didn't want to read the names, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, uh, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So these other people are named, these 13 other people are named, and what are they doing? They're, they're, the people are remaining in their places, and, ever, and these Levites are going around and helping people to, there's three words that's used, to understand, to interpret, and to make sense of the law. Now these are all different words in the Hebrew. Um, And there's a couple of possibilities as to what all of these mean. It could mean, and and I think it's the most basic sense, it means like he's explaining what, these guys are explaining what the text means. So Ezra would read a section, then the people would go, the the Levites would go out and explain what what it means. Or it could be more like a language interpretation because them coming back from exile, being in a foreign land, the people's common language now was, was Aramaic. And so now people are listening to the word in Hebrew. And so when, the, when, the, when Hebrew would be read, there would be some people who probably didn't understand the language. And so the, these Levites would be translating the words Ezra is reading into Aramaic as well. And so I think that you know, both could be in view here. Whatever the case is, people are being given every opportunity to understand what is being read. Whether it's language, whether it's meaning, people are given the opportunity to understand and comprehend what is being read. And I'm sure that all of us have, you know, come to a text in the Bible and we're just like, what is going on here? Like we just come to a text and we've just not understood it. When that's happened, what has your response been? Do you just be like, well, if I don't understand it, I don't understand it. Oh, well. Or have we just gotten you know, frustrated with it? Like, why can't I understand what's going on here? Then we just, you know, we, 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 we just give up. Or have we sought out understanding? Have we, you know, tapped into all the resources that are available to us? You know, there is countless commentaries. There are, you know, resources online that you can, you can look up to help you understand the text. You have a church with, with, with pastors who are trained to help you understand the text. You can come to us and, and we can, tra- you know, help you work through understanding. The point is is that understanding God's word does not, is not something that always comes automatically. It's not something that just you're going to read it, oh, I automatically understand everything about this. It's not how it works. It takes effort. It takes investment. But I think more importantly, it takes humility. That, to understand that you're not always going to understand what you read. You're not always going to understand what's in here. And so you have to humble yourself and say, you know what, I need to seek out understanding. I need to make effort to understand what is happening here. And so this is what the Levites are doing. They're helping the people to understand the text. And what is the people's response to finally understanding the text? Well, we have it here in verse 9. It says, Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So what do the people do when they understand the word? They weep. In verse 10, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink and sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to, the, to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So once they understand the word, they weep. Well, why is that their response to it? Well, I think it's because when, Moses, when, when, when Ezra's reading the law, in the law there are over 613 Old Testament laws. And Israel for, for, for thousands of years had not been fulfilling the requirements of the law. And so when these people hear the word and they hear those commands and they understand that they, are not, they have not been doing what God's expecting of them, that can only lead them to, they have not been who God has called them to be. And so this weeping is a, not only is there, they are convicted, but I think it's also a, a, a weeping of repentance. They are repenting of what they have done or what they have not done really. And this is what the word of God typically does for us as well. Um, Hebrews chapter four, uh, verse 12 says this. It says, indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul, from, uh, divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I think sometimes people don't like to read the word because it does that very thing. Because it convicts. Because you read what's in here and you understand that you have not been doing what God has expected of you. You have not, you know, for, for Christians, maybe it's, it's we're not living up to what God wants from us. And if we're, you know, if, if, you're, if, if you don't believe, it's saying that you are dead in your sins. You are, you are a sinner. That's not something that we want to hear. And so we don't read it because we know that the word can convict us. And can. And like I said, conviction from the word comes when we understand what the word says and we understand that you know, we have not lived up to God's expectation of us. However, after Nehemiah and, 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 and um, Ezra hear this, hear this weeping, they're like, no, 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 that's not what you should be doing. That's not what you should be doing. He says in verse, um, he says in verse 9, he says, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or reap. And then down in verse 11 he says, So the Levites stilled all the people saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. Remember, what month is this happening in? It's happening in the seventh month. And the first day of the seventh month for Israel was the festival of trumpets. Back in um, Leviticus chapter 23, we get this described. It says, uh, starting in verse 23, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of complete rest, a holy convocation commemorated with trumpet blast. You shall not work at your occupations, and you shall present the Lord's offering by fire. So, I think Nehemiah recognizes the significance of this day. This day is set apart for God and because of that it should be a day of joy it should be a day of celebration and I think it's interesting here that it is not just for the people that are gathered there do you notice in verse in verse 10 he says to them go your way eat the fat and drink and sweet wine and send portions to them to those for whom nothing is prepared so this celebration that's happening is not just for the people gathered here, but the people on the outskirts, the people who may not have been able to gather, the people who may not be able to celebrate. Go and allow them to celebrate alongside you. Now, Nehemiah makes it a point that people go and do that, that everyone can take part in this celebration of God's word. And when God's word here in this moment is able to bring rejoicing because it says that if we recognize our sin you know if we recognize our sin forgiveness is available to us 
that conviction may happen and that's uncomfortable, but there is a promise of forgiveness if we confess our sins. First uh, John chapter one, verse nine and 10 is, is, is a beautiful, beautiful verse. It says, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we, have, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Part of understanding the word is understanding that we're sinners. Understanding that we are in need of forgiveness. And, and Israel had the opportunity for forgiveness. that They just had to go and offer the proper sacrifices. And that was part of the, of the festival. And so they, you know, it's not recorded that they may have gone and offered the, the, proper, the proper offerings and, and received forgiveness. And then Nehemiah says, go and celebrate. And that's exactly what they do. They go and they celebrate because they know that they follow a God who is able to forgive them. So even in the moments where we have failed, we can rejoice in a God who doesn't. Even in the moments we fail, we can rejoice in a God who doesn't fail. And that's why Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength doesn't come from you. Your strength doesn't come from your, your ability to do anything or your ability to keep the law. The joy of the Lord is your strength. God is your strength. And that's why they can rejoice. And it says here that they rejoice not because of the festival or anything that's going on around them, but verse 12 says they rejoice because they understood the words that were read to them. That's why they rejoice. Not in their circumstances. They have joy in the Lord. Joy in his revealed word. And that leads them then to this last section of careful obedience. They, 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 they've heard the word. They've paid careful attention to it. It's been explained to them. They understand it. And now they are going to obey it. In, cha- in uh, verse 13 it says, On the second day, the heads of the ancestral houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to the scribe Ezra in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law which the Lord had is which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month and that they should publish and proclaim in all the towns and in Jerusalem as follows. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for them, each, of, each on the roofs of their houses and in the courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in them. For from the days of Jeshua son of Nun to the day, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the festival seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to to the ordinance. So after the people celebrate this festival... Most of the people go home. Most of the people go back to their places to celebrate with their families. But it says that the heads of the houses, so the heads of all the tribes and all the Levites stay back. And what are they doing? They're studying the law together. And in studying the law, they, they find something interesting. They find that during the festival of booze, that Israel was supposed to be staying in tents. In, in, in tents just like the Israelites did in the days of Moses. And then it says that that this had not been done since the days of Joshua. This, they, they had not celebrated it like this since the days of Joshua. Now what's interesting is they had not been necessarily neglecting the festival of booze because if you go back to Ezra chapter 3 it says that they celebrated it. Um, Ezra chapter 3 verse 4 says, and they kept the festival of booze as prescribed and offer the daily burnt offerings by number um, according to the ordinance as required for each day. Meaning that the festival hadn't necessarily fallen out of use, hadn't fallen out of, you know, they, they hadn't stopped doing it, but it wasn't being celebrated to its fullest extent. 
you know, they had been in Ezra, in, 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 in days of Ezra, they had been, you know, offering the proper offerings for it. But they, that was kind of it. They didn't, they didn't do all of what was expected from it. Which was this, that they would stay in tents. They would stay in booths. And this is prescribed again in, in the book of uh, Leviticus 23. You know, I made fun of Leviticus today, but I'm reading a lot from it. Um, but um, in uh, verse 39 of, of Leviticus 23, it says, Now the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the, in the produce of the land, you shall keep the festival of the Lord lasting seven days, a complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day. And on the first day you shall uh, take the fruit of majestic trees, branches of palm trees, bows of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a festival to the Lord seven days in a year, and you shall keep it in the seventh month as a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall live in booths for seven days, all that the citizens of Israel shall live in booths, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I bought, brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So that was the fullness of this command, was to go out and to live in booths, just like they had did in the days of Moses after God had rescued them from Egypt. So, so they hear these words, they find this in the law, and what do they go and do? They go and obey these words. Verse uh, 16 says, So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on the roofs of their houses, and in the courts and in the courts of the house of God. So they go out and they make booths just as the law had said. Now what's interesting here, interesting here, is in verse 17, um, the author makes a note about that these people had returned from captivity, that the people returned from captivity had made the booths. Now, at this point in the narrative, you already know that they had been brought back from captivity. Because we had just read a list of everyone brought back from captivity in chapter 7. So why does the author make a note here about it now? Well, I think what he's doing is he's, he's, he's making this note that just like after God rescued Israel from Egypt and they lived in booze as a reminder of that. So now they've returned back from captivity. God has rescued them from captivity. So now they are to remember what God has done for them. It's a reminder of God's continued faithfulness throughout the years. That even though Israel hasn't kept the law perfectly, even though Israel has failed repeatedly and has rebelled consistently, God is still faithful to rescue them. And so I think the people now, you know, they, maybe they didn't understand what God expected of them, but now they do. Now they fully understand what God expects of them, and they go out and they obey what he commands. And so I heard this quote from one of the commentaries I was reading that I think was just sums up this whole section beautifully. It says, The fear of not knowing what pleases God is then replaced with the joy of understanding the privilege of being the people of God. That they now could shift from fearing not knowing what God wanted from them to now knowing what he expects, but also understanding the privilege of what it means to be the people of God, that God has been faithful to them, that God has rescued them, that they understand who God is and what he has done. And that it's a privilege to be his people and to obey his word. And this word, not just the Old Testament law, all of this word tells us what it means to be the people of God. And, and, and today as the church, it tells us who God is, what he has done for us in Jesus. That he came down and, 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 and you know, died on the cross for our sins and raised so that we could have new life. And that what he expects of us, that we are to now love God and love other people. Now he wants us to be a part of what he's doing in the world. That we are to be his ministers of reconciliation in the world. That we join God in that mission. And then when we understand that and we take part in it, it only leads to rejoicing. It only leads to joy, like it does here in chapter 8. What was this? What do they do after they follow the law? It says, there was very great rejoicing. So all of this here comes together here in this last section. That they 
from the very beginning, they initiate this reading of the word. And they, so because of that, they pay careful attention to every word that's being read. And then they have careful interpretation of the word that, that the Levites are going around and helping people to understand exactly what's going on. And then lastly, because they understand the word, they are now able to go out and to faithfully obey the word. And that's what it should be for us as well. James chapter 1, verse, uh, starting in verse 22, I think sums this idea up. It says, starting in verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they look like. But, but those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. So all of this goes together. We can pay careful attention to the word and carefully interpret the word. But if we don't go out and obey it and do it, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good. It doesn't do anyone else a whole lot of good. All of these must go together. Carefully paying attention to every word that's in here. Carefully interpreting every word that's in here so that we can go out and be who God expects us to be in the world. That go and be doers in the world. Doers of his word. So, Wherever you are this morning, there's a word for you. If you are an unbeliever, if you have never placed your faith in Jesus, maybe the word that you need to hear this morning is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And that when you hear that, your call to action is to place your faith in Jesus, the Jesus that died for your sins so that you could have a new life. Maybe that's what you need to do this morning. Maybe you are someone who is young or someone who is young in the faith. And because of that, people have been, been doubting you and, and look down on you. Well, maybe the word that you need to hear this morning is 1 Timothy 4.12. You know, Paul says to Timothy, do not let others look down on you because you are young, because you are young, but set an example for others in speech, in conduct, in faith, in love, and in purity. So don't let other people's opinions of you determine how you live. But set an example. Know what's expected of you and set an example. And don't, and don't, let, anyone have anyone, don't let anyone say anything bad about you because your life is lived in the way that God wants you to live. But maybe you've been believing for a while. Maybe you've been believing for most of your life. And the word that you need to hear this morning is Hebrews 10.23 that says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, because he who promised is faithful. And our call to action is to just be faithful to the God who has been faithful to us. That's, that's what we do. So wherever you find yourself this morning, this is my charge to you. Don't just be hearers of the word but doers, be doers of the word and go and be blessed in your doing. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and um, we are thankful for your word. And I, God, I just pray that as your people that we can um, just love your word, that we can make it a priority in our lives to, to open this book every day and to, um, and to um, grow deeper in our relationship with you as, as we read it, as we... Um, seek to understand what it means. But I pray that's not where it would end, that we would obey your word, that we would go out and do what you say, that we would go out and we would love, um, love other people, that we would love you, that we would forgive others um, and do exactly what you want uh, from us. God, we love you. In his name that we pray. Amen.